From 1846 to 1869, about 60,000 Mormon pioneers from the American states then existing and from countries in Europe crossed the prairies. These converts to a new religion had earlier been driven out of Ohio and Missouri by neighbors suspicious of their faith and fearful of their political power. After fleeing from Missouri in 1838 to 1839, the followers of Joseph Smith purchased a large tract of malarial swamp on the Illinois bank of the Mississippi River and built what Mormons still call Nuevo the Beautiful. Smith was born on the farm in Sharon, Vermont in 1805, had moved with his family to another farm near Palmyra, New York. There, he claimed, an angel delivered to him a set of golden tablets. Joseph Smith claimed to have translated the plates by miraculous means, and in 1830, he published the resulting manuscript as the Book of Mormon. By the time Nueva was founded, Smith had attracted thousands of converts, and in 1844, he declared himself a candidate for the President of the United States, perhaps to publicize the Mormons' failure to obtain legal protection in various states. Then disaster struck. Growing fear of the saints, political and economic strength in Illinois, rumors of polygamy, a Mormon militia nearly 40,000 strong, and finally, the Mormon leader's high-handed destruction of the Nuevo Expositor, a newspaper published by dissenters, caused anti-Mormon sentiment to boil over into violent reaction. Warrants were issued for Joseph Smith's arrest on the charges of riot and then of treason. And although he feared, as he told his brother Hiram, that we shall be butchered, he gave himself up for trial at Carthage, Illinois. Joseph Smith was shot by an angry mob on June 27, 1844. Six weeks later, Brigham Young, acting president of the Twelve Apostles, assumed leadership of the bereaved church. The whole state, said Governor Thomas Ford of Illinois, is a mob. In September of 1845, when violence and vigilantism on both sides had reached fever pitch, Young and other leaders of the church agreed to leave Illinois as soon as grass grows and water runs. Actually, the great migration of the saints began in early February. On February 9, 1846, with evacuation underway and nearly 2,000 Mormon settlers gathered on the banks of the Mississippi, Brigham Young looked back through the slanting light of the late afternoon and saw the great white temple of fire. If it is the will of the Lord that the temple be burned instead of being defiled by the Gentiles, amen to it, said Brigham Young. The fire, as it turned out, was a minor one, started by an overheated stovepipe. But after the saints left, a second blaze gutted the temple. Fierce windstorm destroyed part of the walls, and finally, the whole structure was razed. The Mormons had sold what they could at the buyer's tight-fisted prices, but much was left behind unsold, including land across the river in Iowa. The journey across Iowa was a terrible one. Animals fed on limbs and bark of trees as grass had not started, Orson Pratt wrote in his diary. Heavy rains turned the trail into a quagmire. Mud seized at the wagon wheels, and at night froze hard. Wrote Brigham Young's brother Lorenzo, a gust of wind blew the tent flat to the ground. The rain came down in torrents so fast that it put out the fire. In a few minutes, it was all darkness, and it was so cold that it seemed as though I must perish. Mormon optimism, though sorely tested, did not entirely vanish. Heber Kimball's newlywed daughter, Helen Marr Whitney, wrote, I could knit and read as we traveled, and Horace could read or play his flute. A little wagon all to ourselves, which under the circumstances was next thing to paradise. The Nuevo Brass Band played at night with the shivering saints, and how that music issuing from the instruments, licked by the firelight, must have quivered with memories of happier nights. Little trace is left here of the progress of the camp of Israel, as the Mormons in their flight styled themselves. Famous campgrounds in the Mormon legend are plain fields crossed by mild creeks with willows nodding on the banks. 
The Camp of Israel, after considerable disorder at the outset, became probably the best organized migration in American history. Formed into companies of 100 families, each under a captain, every wagon train was supported by the skills of artisans, blacksmiths, carpenters, and so on. Each woman was a cook and a seamstress. Each man was a herdsman or farmer, and when needed, arose a soldier. The camp marched under the discipline of faith, and Brigham Young, as its Moses and its commanding general, issued prayers, exhortations, or reprimands as circumstances required. The progress west through Iowa in 1846 was, for the saints, as for all those who passed that way, a matter of crossing rivers. Locust Creek, just east of the modern-day town of Sewell, Iowa, is surely the most famous stream in Mormon history. Here, William Clayton, official clerk of the Exodus and strong right arm of Brigham Young all his life, wrote the words of the hymn that most deeply stirs Mormon hearts, Come, come, ye saints. Clayton, accompanied by three of his wives, had left another, Diantha in Nuevo, great with child. On Wednesday, April 15th, news came to Clayton that Diantha, though sick with egg and mumps, had given birth to a son 15 days earlier. That same morning, he recorded, I composed a new song, All Is Well. Those were the last words of the hymn, and they became the marching motto of the saints. A few miles beyond, at Garden Grove, the Camp of Israel established its first real way station. Showing the characteristic diligence, the saints with more than 170 men working cleared 715 acres in three weeks, cutting 10,000 rails for fences and built houses. This was to be a place to offer shelter for those coming behind, and that was the keynote of the Western movement of the Mormons. All along the trail, they built and planted and improved cut down steep riverbanks and constructed ferries, signposted exact distances, and set up storehouses of food and other supplies. They knew that their faith would beckon thousands across the prairies, and that what they would accomplish would make the journey easier for those who followed. Beyond Garden Grove lies Mount Pisgah, so named by one of the Brigham's stalwarts, Parley P. Pratt, for the biblical upland. Here in the first six months of 1846, bedded, sometimes in caves, an estimated 150 pioneers died of the scourges of the trail, black scurvy, cholera, typhoid, tuberculosis, or in childbirth. Before the site was abandoned in 1852, perhaps as many as 800 died here. Even greater suffering was yet to come. The saints crossed the Missouri River at Council Bluffs and set up a new camp in Indian lands. This encampment on the Missouri, at what is now the Omaha suburb of Florence, Nebraska, became known as Winter Quarters. A memorial plaque in the Mormon Pioneer Cemetery says that of the 3,483 saints who wintered here in dugouts, sawed houses, and rude log cabins, more than 600 died of fever and other ailments. Neither the medicinals of the time, nor the laying on of hands, a common means of healing among the Mormons, availed against the epidemic. Love was the ultimate therapy. As Patty Sessions, one of the midwives, lay gravely ill, Brigham Young came to her. To the woman nursing her, he said, he must all hold on to her as long as she breathes. In this case, love worked its miracle. Mrs. Sessions recovered and lived to the age of 98. As spring approached, nearly 10,000 Mormons were encamped on both sides of the Missouri River, about 3,500 in winter quarters, and the remainder at Mount Pisgah, Garden Grove, and Council Bluffs in Iowa, or scattered along the trail, working to raise money for the Camp of Israel. Recognizing that it was impossible for as well organized a people as the Saints to move such a large number in one body, Brigham Young and the Council of Twelve determined that a pioneer company should be sent ahead to mark the trail, measure the hazards, and, highest objectives, lay the cornerstone of the new Zion. Brigham knew that he was heading for the valley of the Great Salt Lake, and he had maps of a sort, but few had ever actually seen that empty desert. 
with biblical sonority, he announced that the first pioneer company would consist only of vigorous males. But Brigham, if he was a stern man, was also a man with a most human weakness. He loved his brother, Lorenzo, and he couldn't find it in his heart to refuse Lorenzo's plea to take along his ailing wife Harriet and her two children. Brigham then decided to bring one of his own wives, Harriet's daughter, Clara, and Heber Kimball brought one as well, Ellen Sanders. When the expedition started west in April 5, 1847, it numbered 142 men and boys, three women, and two children. There were 72 wagons, 93 horses, 52 mules, 66 oxen, 19 cows, and 17 dogs. Wilford Woodruff, later to be the church president, who in 1890 suspended the practice of polygamy, had prepared soberly for the journey. I have never felt more weight upon my mind while leaving my family to go on a mission than now, he wrote in his diary. On April 18th, reports Woodruff, President Young called the captains together, 14 men including Woodruff, one for every 10 saints in the company, and gave them instructions to travel in the morning, two abreast, and let all who were not driving teams carry their guns captain loaded and walk by the side of the wagons. Let no man go away hunting to get out of sight of the camp. The bugle was to be blown at half past seven o'clock at night, when all was to go to prayer and retire to bed. The bugle will blow at five o'clock in the morning, and two hours will be allotted to the camp to arise and pray, breakfast, feed horses, harness, and start the blowing of the bugle at seven o'clock. There were scarcely two trees between the Grand Island and Fort Laramie a distance of 300 miles. Among the rare signs of humanity were the occasional Indians who appeared on the horizon and sometimes ventured closer, but for the whole 111 days of their trip to Salt Lake Valley, Brigham's men had no real trouble with the Indians. Perhaps the pioneers realized that Indians, who were usually described as thieves by the white men passing through their territory, were in truth toll collectors. That was a concept Brigham Young would have understood and approved. In that broad plain, on May 1st, the pioneers had their first buffalo hunt. It was a wild affair, with Mormon horsemen more than once in peril of being tumbled by the great beasts. Heber Kimball borrowed a 15-shooter and joined the rest. The women and children watched in amusement as Heber Kimball dropped his reins trailing while he aimed the big rifle and galloped precariously in the dust among the beasts. Twelve buffalo were killed and the saints feasted. They saw antelope, wolves, and a myriad of birds as well as bison. And on May 18th, Brigham Young sharply reproved the hunters for shooting so much meat when it was not needed. By the 1st of May, the company had crossed the 100th Meridian, which lies near the present-day town of Kozad, Nebraska. West of this line, there is insufficient rainfall to grow unirrigated crops. There the imaginative traveler can scent the parched wind of the great American desert. If the Mormons did not know what a fateful line they had crossed, they nevertheless missed few landmarks and few natural phenomena. Their man of science, Orson Pratt, took daily measurements with barometer and compass, and partway across Nebraska, the company's jack-of-all-trades, Appleton Harmon, installed a remarkable device designed by Pratt and William Clayton that was activated by a screw and a wheel of 60 cogs and measured mileage. They called it a road meter. Mounted on a wagon wheel, it provided an accurate measure of elapsed distance on the way west. When the Mormons reached the site of present-day Kearney, Nebraska, they remained on the north bank of the Platte River. And this is what distinguishes the Mormon Trail from the Oregon Trail in this section. The latter ran along the south bank. The Mormons chose the north side not so much to isolate themselves across the shallow stream as to avoid competing for grazing and campsites. From here it was 300 miles to Fort Laramie along a broad, flat floodplain, a natural highway running between low bluffs. The Platte was a godsend for it provided water and forage and easy passage. If it hadn't been there, the United States might well have ended at the mighty Missouri. Near today's town of Sutherland, the company entered Nebraska's Sandhill country 
The first slope they encountered was aptly named the Ox Killer. From Indian Lookout, west of Lisco, Porter Rockwell excited the Mormons by a report that he had seen Chimney Rock, estimated from rough maps to be halfway to the Salt Lake. By now it was late May, and the pioneers, gradually growing accustomed to the routine of the trail, were finding ways to amuse themselves after long days of slow walking and hard work. <coughs> Music and dancing have always been part of the Mormon way. But on May 28th, a lively dance in musicale, joined by three black slaves who accompanied the pioneering company, had gone on too long. The next morning, Brigham assembled a company, mounted a wagon, and issued one of the tongue lashings for which he was to be as famous in his lifetime as it was for his piousness. According to Woodruff's diary, Brigham thundered, quote, I would rather be alone, and I am now resolved not to go on any further with this camp unless you quit your folly and wickedness. Nearly the whole camp has been card playing, dancing, niggering, and whoring. Oh yes, you did play cards, dice, checkers, and dominoes. You would shrink from the glance of the eyes of God's angels." End quote. The rest of the day, the chastened company proceeded in a marked change of mood, and the next day, May 30th, a Sabbath, was set aside as a day of prayer and fasting. After a morning prayer meeting, Brigham and the other apostles donned their temple robes, about a solemn thing as you can possibly do, and retired to prayer and meditate. Two days later, they camped on the south side of the Platte near Fort Laramie. Here a grand reunion was held, for they met a party of Mormons led by the Robert Crow family, who had come up from Mississippi and wintered at Pueblo, Colorado. They were 543 and one quarter miles from winter quarters, and about to say goodbye to the Platte. At Fort Casper, where the Mormons built a famous ferry across the last horseshoe of the Platte, they moved along the trail past beds of saleratus, a natural baking soda. They were pleased with themselves when it made their bread rice. They also washed their hair in sagebrush and drank so much of an herbal brew that it's still known to some as Mormon tea. They climbed a long hill and passed through the immigrant gap, so mild a gateway to the west that one would not know he was there unless it had been told. Martin's Cove is a name solemn in Mormon folklore, a rifle shot west of Independence Rock, a hump of soft stone covered by carved initials of pioneers, a grim reminder of death in the snow. Here on November of 1856, 576 members of Handcart Company No. 4, led by Captain Edward Martin, were trapped by an early blizzard. They had walked across the plains, trundling all their belongings in high-wheeled carts. Though a rescue party from Salt Lake City reached them, 145 died here. Next to the Platte, the most important stream on the trail is the Sweetwater, which washes the base of Independence Rock and then meanders across the trail in many fordings for the next 93 miles. The Sweetwater has its great monument when it plunges through Devil's Gate, a massive split rock 375 feet high just east of Martin's Cove and west of Independence Rock. Then it becomes a whispering brook, humble, hardly noticeable, but lifter of the cup of life to all who pass through the thirsty country to the mountains. On June 28th at the Little Sandy, some miles west of the Divide, the pioneers met Jim Bridger, most famous of the mountain men, and, with good fortune that must have seemed divinely inspired to the Mormons, one of the few white men who had seen the Salt Lake Valley. His trading post, Fort Bridger, was a hundred miles to the southwest. He spent the night in camp, yarning until well past the saint's bedtime, giving Brigham and the others all manner of information and encouragement. He did wonder if wheat and corn would grow in the valley, considering the coldness of the nights. At Fort Bridger, the Mormon trail diverged from the others that went west. The Oregonians and Californians turned north. The Mormons turned south and west toward the fanged Wasatch Range. On June 30th, while encamped on the banks of the Green River among the wild apple trees and wild roses, Brigham's men were joined by Samuel Brannan, a Mormon who had left New York by ship on February 4th 
1846. He and his company had sailed around the Cape Horn and found a Mormon colony in San Francisco Bay. He sang the praises of the California climate, but Brigham would hear none of it. He was leading the saints to sanctuary. They would make up their own paradise in the desert, perhaps even their own country. In subsequent years, patriotism was instilled in every Mormon, but the times in which these fugitives fled were times of disillusionment with a federal government. On July 4th, one of Brigham's company, Norton Jacob, wrote in his journal, This is Uncle Sam's day of independence. Well, we are independent of all the powers of the Gentiles, and that's enough for us. Like many others in the company, Jacob, as he wrote, lay ill with a malady the pioneers called mountain fever. Historians speculate this may have been either Rocky Mountain spotted fever or Colorado tick fever both carried by wood ticks. It was excruciating, with pains in the joints and headache and fever, and sometimes delirium. But the sickness was not fatal, and it passed after a few days. By the time Norton Jacob was stricken, the Pioneer Company was only about a 100 miles from its goal. But these would be the most difficult miles of the journey. On July 12th, Brigham Young himself was stricken with mountain fever. Evidently, he had a particularly bad case, for Brigham, the Lion of the Lord, was unable to rise from his pallet. Still, he was not too sick to keep the saints from their labor. A party was sent ahead to build a road through the mountains. At these higher elevations, water froze in the buckets at night, even in July. The men found snow in the shade and had a snowball fight. But Elder was in the flower, gooseberries were ripe, and prophecy of fertility Wild roses and wild wheat and other alpine flora bloomed by the banks of clean rushing streams. The work party slashed at tangles of willow, manhandled rock, and laid the crude road. The wagons, mile by painful mile, came on. Willow stubble slashed at the hooves of oxen and horses. One man's wagon, with two children inside, overturned, but fortunately there were no injuries. The Mormons passed through Echo Canyon, over Big Mountain and Little Mountain, and down Immigration Canyon. And then, on July 24, 1847, Brigham Young came into a full view of the valley of the Great Salt Lake. Still feverish and weak, he was lying on Wilford Woodruff's carriage, and he lifted himself to look upon the promised destination. Many years afterwards, Woodruff was to recall that Brigham at that time said, It is enough. This is the right place. It has often been remarked that if Brigham Young did not actually say that, he would have. What Woodruff himself said on the very day, as recorded in his journal, expresses the soaring song in his heart. Quote, Land of promise, held in reserve by the hand of God for a resting place of the saints. Our hearts were surely made glad to gaze upon the valley of such vast extent, entirely surrounded with a perfect chain of everlasting hills and mountains covered with the eternal snows, towering toward heaven. Others had come down into the valley two days before them. Five acres of land had already been put under irrigation, and a crop was in the ground. Tradition says that Brigham thrust his cane into the soil and selected a site for the temple. Quote, And we will have a city clean and in order, he decreed. And so ever since they have, with the everlasting hills, Mountains covered with snow towering toward heaven.